and welcome to the stories of Northern Life from the Sault Ste. Marie Museum. We currently have a special pop-up traveling exhibit on display in our military gallery. This exhibit is called Dear Sadie, Love, Lives, and Remembrance of Ontario's First World War. And it was made by the Archives of Ontario. I'm going to focus on the love part in light of Valentine's Day. I'm going to share the story of Harry Mason and his love, Sadie Arbuckle. Then relate this war story to the Women's Overseas Army Unit in World War II, who wrote letters to soldiers that they maybe have never met before as well, and how their letters sparked so much love in a time full of hate. So let's get into it. Let's meet Harry Mason. He was born in Denver, Colorado in 1892. And when he was 13, he and his family moved just outside of Toronto. At 16, he was hired by the Bank of Toronto, but during this time working for the bank, he was actually transferred a little closer to us in Sudbury and then the Winnipeg branch as well. Eventually, he stopped working for the Bank of Toronto and was living in a new settlement of Comper, Alberta, working to build the town's first store. His business partner was Jack Wolf, and Jack had a friend named Sadie Arbuckle from back home in Toronto. Jack and Sadie kept in touch, and Sadie would even send cards to Harry too, as a courtesy. At this time, Harry was very overwhelmed by loneliness and hardship of homesteading in the West, and took this opportunity to start a correspondence with Sadie. And this correspondence would change both of their lives. On October 28, 1913, at 21 years old, Harry wrote the first of many letters to Sadie Arbuckle, a woman he had never met. He talked about his work and the store they were starting. He apologized for taking the liberty of writing to her, someone I never met personally, he said. Sadie forgave the breach of etiquette and wrote him back to his immediate pleasure and relief. Even though we don't have Sadie's letters from this time, we know her life was very different from Harry's. While he was settling in new lands, Sadie was living in the heart of one of Canada's largest cities. In 1914, Toronto had the population of nearly 500,000. She was living at 930 Queen Street East, a densely populated upper middle class neighborhood served by robust streetcar systems. Her letters describe a busy urban life. She worked in an office in the city, visited often with family and friends, attended church, and frequently went to the movies. Her social life was a stark contrast to a Harry's occasional community dances. But both of their lives were all about to change as the First World War broke out. More than 628,000 Canadians would serve in the armed forces, and Harry was one of them. In July 1915, Harry Mason enlisted as a lieutenant in the Canadian Force, and joining the war effort brought him and joining the war effort brought him back to Ontario for training. Harry's first letter as a soldier is dated December 16, 1915, and is written on the 80th Battalion's letterhead. In it, he is enthusiastic about the life of a soldier in training, and explains that he expects to be promoted to the rank of captain soon. While he was back in Ontario, Harry was able to visit Toronto on his first leave and spent, the, and spent the entire day with Sadie, probably for the first time, and describes it as the most satisfying and pleasant I have ever spent. He continued to visit her on his leave days, and in one of his visits, he gifted her a dog named Lord Roberts II, or Bob's. Bob's would feature heavily in the rest of their correspondence, as Sadie provided updates regarding his behavior and Harry offered training advice. In February 1916, the 80th Battalion received word that they would be deployed to England. 
Harry and his comrades greeted the news enthusiastically, but Sadie was concerned. Following the announcement, Harry is sent to Belleville and Montreal for further training. During this time, he is able to meet Sadie in Toronto for a few more times. He visited her for the last time in April 1916. Although she still had not declared her love for Harry, seeing each other again made the upcoming separation seem more immediate for both of them. She wrote in a letter, Harry, I don't understand myself since you left. Yesterday and today, I cannot keep the tears back. It is loneliness. I think it must be. Dated April 12th, 1916. Harry's reply, on the 24th of April, 1916. Sweetheart, I wonder if I shall ever see your dear, dear face again. If I will ever hold you so very close to me and kiss you. Oh, I cannot hardly bear to go. Please, dear, don't love me. Don't please, Sadie. Not now. I don't know just how I feel, Harry. But I do know this. I want you to come back was Sadie's response on the 26th of April. On May 16th, 1916, just one month before Harry's 24th birthday, he left for England abroad the SS Baltic. 33,000 Canadian soldiers landed in Britain on October 16th, 1914. From there, they would soon transport to France and were fighting at the front lines. Harry arrived at the front as part of the 4th Canadian Division, nearly a year later. After training in England, he was deployed to France in August 1916. After the 80th Battalion sailed to England, it was absorbed into other units, and Harry found himself a part of the 67th Battalion, known as the Western Scots. He was deployed to France on August 9, 1916, and was in the trenches of Belgium by August 19. The 67th was a pioneer battalion, which meant it was primarily responsible for engineering tasks, such as construction and repair work. For Harry, this meant digging and fortifying trenches, building sandbag blockades, and providing supply routes for other units all while under enemy fire. Our tour here has been a very long one, much longer than usual. We, as pioneers, don't do so badly. Our work is very hard and dangerous, but at least we return after each tour to billets, where we can get dry and warm before going out again. The infantry admire and pity the pioneers in the work because we must defy Fritz, and go on with the work no matter how intense the fire. They wouldn't transfer into pioneers if they could help it, Harry said in a letter on November 7th, 1916. Harry was very enthusiastic at first. He worked long and hard, but then as time went on, he started seeing his friends die right beside him in the trenches, and it obviously took a toll on him, and same with Sadie. I can't understand why they don't have a monstrous battle and end it all in a hurry. But they just keep taking more men on all the time. And yet, there doesn't seem to be any victories won. I guess I don't understand enough about it. About war. I only knew it is a great big world, and into it all the boys are going. Not knowing really what it is they're going into, but brave enough to take their chances. I can picture the celebration when it's over, Harry. Can't you? All the happiness when the boys come back? Must not say more about it. You hear enough about the subject, don't you? Sadie wrote, February 27th, 1916. Again, she wrote on the 6th of February. I wonder how many times I have wished I were a boy. I seem to like their sports much more, like riding, climbing trees, etc., Oh, I would just love to be going as a soldier, if I had been a boy. Worse luck I'm not. I surely would have been one of some kind. A girl has to wait for results, where a boy can just go and see them. Suppose you are shocked at me by now. 
As her frustration grew, she was thinking about being trained as a Red Cross nurse so she can go and do a part as a woman could do in the war. On the other side, Harry grew a strong admiration for the soldiers flying over the battlefields. And so he applied for the Royal Flying Corps. And with his strong sense of duty and his experience in the trenches, he was accepted into the corps on January 4th, 1917, and begun training as a gunner. Sadie was not overly thrilled with this change, but knew Harry made up his mind. Harry's love for Sadie was deep, and in the later years in his letters, he was not afraid to express his love and admiration. Our souls never die. And should my body die over there, sweetheart, please ever remember that the soul of me, which ever lives, is still living with you inside. And that my wish and prayer is that you shall have happiness. You can be happy to know that I wasn't afraid, and that till the very end, all the words, I loved only you, Harry wrote on August 4th, 1916. Do you know that I wouldn't even think of going to the trenches without your pictures in my pocket? To me, they are a charm which saves me from all danger. If such a thing should happen, that I am wounded, I have engraved on the back of my identity disc to advise you, also Dad, who will receive word by cable and will wire you. Harry wrote on the 8th of September, 1916. On April 22nd, 1917, Harry wrote his final letter to Sadie. In it, he describes the toll the war is taking on him, and it is evident that his perspective has changed tremendously. This is not the fresh soldier brimming with enthusiasm. This is a man who has seen the battle from the ground and from the air, and no longer cares for any of it. It is strenuous, sweetheart. I'm tired. What's the use, Sadie, of all of this horrible slaughter? Surely it has gone far enough now for the world to learn its futility. There are shell holes and craters, mine craters, filled with blood. It turns me sick. I'm afraid, sweetheart, that this is getting on my nerves. The horror of it all is too continuous. This is a horrid letter, sweetheart. I should never write to you of war. I know you already hear too much of it, and I'm afraid you will worry, dear. Please do not. Harry wrote on April 22nd, 1917. Lieutenant Harry Mason was killed in action on April 28th, 1917. His plane was shot down over Arras, France, and he and his pilot were both killed instantly. To Miss Sadie Artbuckle, Toronto, Ontario. Dear Miss Artbuckle, we received a cablegram from Ottawa that my brother Harry has been killed in action on April 28th. Harry often spoke of you and we thought you should know of his death. We shall probably get further word as to the manner of his death in a week or so and we'll send the particulars to you if you wish. We all feel his loss very keenly and knowing that you were very dear to Harry, wish you accept our dearest sympathy. Very sincerely, A. Ruby Mason, May 5th, 1917. Sadie had not yet received word of Harry's death when she sent the final letter. In it, she makes one final attempt to be of some use to a man who was facing horrors she knows she cannot understand. Harry, are you in need of socks? Has your supply given out yet? You told me you had plenty, but by this time, you will have worn them out. Please tell me, and isn't there anything else you would care for? Luxuries of any kind? If you were in the trenches, I would know what to send you. As it is, I don't know how you are treated, or just what you are given to eat. Please write and ask me for something. Sadie wrote May 7th, 1917. The Great War ended on November 11th, 1918, and by that time, 66,573 Canadians had been killed, 138,666 wounded. 
Harry Mason was just one of the soldiers. But the letters between Harry and Sadie act as a reminder that each one of the Canadians' fallen soldiers had an individual life full of love, hopes, and dreams. The families and friends they left behind had to continue on, altering their future plans to deal with the stark reality of loss. Reading the correspondence between Harry and Sadie help us to remember the humanity behind an inhumane war. Through these letters, it is easier to put ourselves in the boots of these soldiers or in the shoes of their loved ones at home. Spending time with Harry and Sadie helps us to remember all of those who fought in Ontario's First World War. When I finished reading the entire story written out by the Archives of Ontario and Harry and Sadie themselves, I was left holding back my tears sitting at the front desk of the museum. There was no happy ending to this love story, but that doesn't mean that there was no love. The deep, meaningful connections that they made and constant dialogue brought greater joy and fulfillment into their lives than without. I couldn't help but imagine if this was my life. I am 23, the same age as Harry when he first went overseas. But because I am a female, I would not have been going overseas. The person I am in love with would have. I know I would have felt the same as Sadie, feeling like I'm not being of help, feeling like I couldn't make a difference over here in Canada. Only my words can bring love and comfort in hopes of boosting their spirits. During the Second World War, women in Sault Ste. Marie recognized this idea that the men were needing more love and support while overseas. So local women started a group called the Women's Overseas Army Unit. They would send letters and boxes to the men at war from the Sioux and area. We see in the letters that their correspondence indicates that there is gratitude and love from both sides. Alicia, our outreach and education officer, will read to you a few examples of the letters we have. The first letter I'm going to read for you today is correspondence between the Overseas Unit and the Kiwanis Club. This letter is addressed to R.R. Hanna. He's the chairman of the War Charities Committee. Dear Mr. Hanna, we wish to draw your attention the fact that a Women's Overseas Army Unit has been formed for the purpose of providing comforts for the overseas men from this vicinity. We also hope to be able to take an interest in the welfare of their families at home. As there are approximately 1,300 names on our list, we realize the magnitude of our undertaking, and any assistance you can give us in this work will be very much appreciated. Yours very truly, Women's Overseas Army Unit. This letter was dated April 27, 1944. Our second correspondence letter is addressed to a Mr. and Mrs. John Dent, local Albert Street East, Sault Ste. Marie. This correspondence was again from the overseas unit, sending thanks for a donation in regards to a fundraiser. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Dent, at a recent meeting of the Women's Overseas Army Unit, I was instructed to write and thank you both for your help in connection with the lovely quilt that Mrs. Dent so kindly donated to the unit and helped sell tickets on. And to you, Mr. Dent, for selling so many tickets. We made $112 on the quilt, which is certainly a grand addition to our funds for overseas boxes. Wishing you both best wishes for the new year. Yours sincerely, the Secretary. This letter was dated on January 15th, 1945. Our third letter that I'm going to read for you today is correspondence from a Sault Ste. Marie soldier who's stationed somewhere overseas. He doesn't actually say in the letter where he's stationed. This is him thanking the Women's Overseas Unit for the parcel that he had just received. Secretary, Women's Overseas Army Unit. Dear Madam, I have just received your Christmas parcel today. I certainly appreciate your thoughtfulness and want to thank all of the ladies in your unit for this lovely gift to me. I know you are all doing your part towards victory, which I am sure is not far off. 
I do hope in the near future I will be able to meet all of the members of your unit and thank them personally. Until then, I remain yours sincerely, Roy Scott. Dated February the 7th, 1945. The final letter I'm going to read for you today again involves a soldier giving thanks to the unit for the parcels he's received. He also goes into great detail about his experience in a city in Belgium. Dear Madam, it gave me great pleasure to receive your parcel, which I received this evening, and I thank you very much. As I am writing now, I am writing by candlelight. I had a few days leave in a city in Belgium. The people in Belgium are more friendly than the French and are more grateful for their liberation. I guess they must have had a harder time. They speak Flemish and French. Just a quick note to add, uh, Flemish means Dutch. So in Belgium, the people there speak Dutch and French. I stayed at a civilian's house. I ate and slept there and they treated me like I was one of their own sons. It sure felt good to sleep on a bed again after sleeping in a out truck. They sell ice cream and I sure ate a lot of it. The grapes are cheap and plentiful. The people in the country wear wooden shoes. I can see why they wear them with all of this mud around. They take them off before they go in the house and use a clean pair for in the house. So in front of the door, there's usually a couple pairs of wooden shoes. They look big and clumsy. I can't see how they walk around with them. I hope you received the other letters I wrote, thanking you for the other parcel. Thanks for the Christmas card. Yours truly, M. Bostica. P.S. Wishing you all a Merry Christmas. You can tell that these letters and boxes made a difference in the soldiers' lives. Small acts of kindness were what they were living for during these hard times. It is amazing to see that the local community was doing everything they could to give to these men. Love truly exists in the darkest places. I hope you learned a little something new about Sault Ste. Marie history today, and that the Dear Sadie story brought to us by the Archives of Ontario gave you a deeper understanding of the day-to-day -day life as a soldier and a woman at home who was in love with a soldier away at war. To see more pictures and letters from Harry and Sadie, head over to our website, suemuseum.ca and look under current exhibits. There you will find more info. If you have any love letters or letters of any kind, I would love to see them in the collection here at the Sioux Museum to be shared as well as documented and stored safely for future generations to come. I hope you give someone you love today a great big hug and tell them you love them. Tell a stranger you love them. I think we all need a little bit more love and kindness in our day-to-day -day lives, no matter the circumstances. Thank you so much for listening to the Stories of Northern Life podcast, and I will talk to you next week for a story in honor of Black History Month of a beautiful and talented woman who lived in the 18 to 1900s as an artist. Ciao for now.